Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you. Um, there seems to be a tradition here of uh, advertising our positions on, uh, on scalability. Um, so, you know, Peter, for example, has been inspiring us for decades working on this question, scalability meaning the ease of language assembly, putting things together with blocks. Um, but uh, there have been a few other perspectives, like Paul and Eric uh, have been talking about a different dimension, which is essentially scalability in terms of complexity of the language being defined. Um, I've thrown this uh, provocative pseudograph up here to say that I worry a little bit that there may be an inverse relationship. I don't know. But after this talk, we're going to drinks, which is a wonderful time to discuss this question. So really, there are different kinds of scalability, scaling to real languages, scaling in terms of human effort, and so on. And it's great that we're open to all of these different perspectives. Now, my own um, interest in uh, semantics and the thing that inspires the title I put up about natural science is I've spent the past decade trying to semanticize a bunch of different uh, so-called real-world things. For instance, um, I've done a fair bit of work on JavaScript semantics, which I will talk about a little bit today. We've done a semantics for Python. I've worked with Excel, um, access control languages, but also things like uh, cryptographic protocols, you know, Alice and Bob diagrams, and trying to formalize exactly what those mean and what the underlying cryptographic assumptions are. More recently, jQuery, which is a web-based query language, uh, the core of browsers. And finally, um, Cisco boxes, routers. And the more I've done this kind of work, the more I have been concerned of this question of validation. Now, of course, we know there's two kinds of validation always. There's kind of an internal validation. Does the thing as defined make sense? We prove soundness theorems and so on. But there's also external validation, which I think is at least as important when we're dealing with these externally defined realities. So, you know, in some cases, like in the case of programming languages, there are test suites, and it's pretty straightforward. You test against them. And several other people have also talked about testing against languages. Um, and sometimes you have to go refer to books. You know, you take a canonical book or some interesting book that has non-trivial examples. Um, sometimes you take suites of examples in the case of ExactMill or in these, uh, for example, in the um, cryptographic protocols, there's a group at uh, ENS Kashan that has a suite of 106 different cryptographic protocols written down, and that's what we validated against. Um, case of browsers, there's so little written down properly, formally, that we just generated large numbers of inputs and tried them out, uh, kind of like Jose was talking about yesterday. And finally, in the case of uh, you know, Cisco routers, this is the one thing that's a little different. We went on eBay and actually bought a Cisco box, a cheap used Cisco box, and threw you know, thousands of packets at it, trying to understand how this thing works. Um, you got to do what you've got to do. Now, why bother validating? It seems like there's an obvious answer, right? I mean, otherwise, how do you know what it's doing? But sometimes there are pleasant side effects of doing this kind of validation. In the case of Cisco, for instance, um, it, by the way, when I, when, I give, when I give a talk like this in a networking audience, by this time, three hands have gone up. The question is always, where did you get a parser for iOS? This is always, you would not believe, this is always the first question. How did you manage to parse IOS files? Um, it turns out, apparently, this is a really big deal. What do I know? Um, because Cisco doesn't really publish the syntax. They don't publish a spec. They don't publish anything particularly useful. But underneath this horrible IOS language, the surface syntax, the underlying model is actually a very pleasant one that isn't published, isn't written down, but you can discover over time. There's a really beautiful structure to the way a Cisco IOS box works. And one of the things we did was to come up with very nice relational specifications for each of the boxes you see here and compose them in cl using classical composition methods, the kind that you know, people like Cliff and Tony have been telling us to do for decades, compose them and obtain in that fashion both individual pieces and a composition to describe the behavior of one of these boxes. Right? So this validation process can actually be an inspiring one because you come up with things that are better than what they look like. You know, you get this ugly gray box, but it's actually got very deep structure. Um, so the superficial horribleness can actually mask a underlying beauty, or you know, it could be JavaScript. Um, 
<laughs> so this is, this is the part of the talk where there's actually going to be audience participation. There will be quizzes. Please be prepared. Um, here is JavaScript. Uh, it's a book. Uh, this is a very nice book written by a guy named Douglas Crockford, who knows about as much JavaScript as any human being alive. So anything that I quote here is not to suggest Doug doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. Um, and so uh, Crockford writes in his book, you know, for instance, he says, JavaScript um, has much in common with Scheme. And because of this deep similarity, this is sort of a very nice, elegant language that you can understand. Essentially, what he's saying is, you know, JavaScript. Good. So this is good for me, right? This is, this is my bread and butter. Um, all right. So I might call on you on, by name, so be prepared. Uh, how many of you have seen the talk, what? Ah, yes. OK, good. Um, very good. What does this program evaluate to in JavaScript? I'm adding the empty array to the empty array. Anyone? Come on, take a guess. Zero. Zero? OK, it's the empty string. Good. So what does the empty array added to the empty object yield? Zero. Zero? OK. Object. Uh, OK, very good. What does the empty object added to the empty array? I mean, it's obviously, it's arithmetic, so it must be, right? Yes? OK, obviously. Yes? Yes? Sebastian, sorry, zero. OK. And then, uh, you know, by cancellation laws or something like that, what should the empty object yield added to the empty object be? Nobody wants to even venture a guess. Well, it's clearly not a number, right? It's, a, it's the one thing that's actually true on the slide. Um, by the way, it's actually very interesting. If you look at what's going on on that last line, it's actually parsing the empty object semicolon unary addition of the empty object. OK, so, so this, this is life in JavaScript land. Um, you know, here's a little function. I take uh, x, and I assign x to x, and I return the value of x. So clearly, x is getting bound over there. It's getting its value from that x over there, which is bound there, which is 200. So clearly, this function yields 200, right? Yes, clear? Yes, OK, that's obviously why the function yields undefined, because you know that x is actually the same x, et cetera. OK, well, so OK, so its scope rules are a little funnier than we think. But uh, here's another example. I'm going to take this object, obj, and I'm going to uh, look up a field in it. So if I send it a y, um, I change the value of x in the top level. Um, if I send it an x, um, I actually read y from the top level and assign it to the x that I sent in. So notice that the arrows depend on the input. You know, is this language even statically scoped? Who knows? Um, and then, of course, this, is, this one's absolutely lovely. Uh, <laughs> I assume it's completely clear to everyone here who does like web security that this is window.location, i.e. a very dangerous thing to allow a programmer to write in their programs. It's actually a wonderful website that will take any JavaScript code you write and convert it into this form. And if you wish, there's a button you can toggle to say, please also wrap the word eval around it, just, you know, just because <laughs> it's really good. OK. So here's Doug Crockford's comment, and here's reality. So Crockford's comment is useful in terms of trying to gain a foothold. You know, like Dominique said in our previous talk, we start off with these lies, these simplifying lies. This is a perfectly good thing to do. The problem is, when it comes to trying to build tools, when it comes to doing web security research or building static analysis tools and so on, these lies are actually actively dangerous because people stop at this point. In fact, for several years, we were reading these papers that would say, we have a sound analysis for JavaScript. Um, Ironically, uh, you know, our papers are getting rejected because we said we didn't know how to prove soundness. And they said, well, that obviously, they haven't proven soundness, so we should reject the paper. Right? So it turns out that the thing to do in computer science conferences is bluff. Right? They don't call you bluff. You just say, we have a sound analysis. It's good. <laughs> so um, you know, a different way to look at this, uh, you know, Emery Berger sent me this beautiful photograph once. He said, this is the essence of JavaScript for you. <laughs> <laughs> So the problem is there's that much lying going on. So we said, OK, well, we want to prove soundness. So we'd like to actually write down a semantics against which we can prove soundness. So we wrote down a semantics, right? I mean, we all know how to write down a semantics. Everybody in this room can write one down in you know, an hour or so. Um, so we called it the essence of JavaScript. Always helps to be bold. So here's more or less the essence of JavaScript. I don't expect you to read it. It's a, it's a semantics, right? It's a semantics like we can all write down. Now, the question is why you should have any faith in this semantics. Well. So here are JavaScript programs. And over on the other side are Lambda.js programs. 
They were in this tiny little language that fits on a page compared to this 250 page programming language. Well, it's understood that implicitly in our heads there is some sort of desugaring process, right? We do this every time we write on a lambda language of some sort. In our heads is some idea that everything on the left can be converted to a program on the right, right? There is a complete, you know, every single one of these things can be represented on the right. Well, um, we kind of made the mistake of implementing desugaring. Uh, this is a mistake because, you know, it's pretty trivial to write an interpreter for Lambda.js. Uh, now, if you compose these two things, you get an implementation of the language. As you may have heard, there are other implementations of the language. So you can then ask, how do these compare? And so, in fact, writing down Lambda.js took, well, you know, as I'm going to talk about this later in the talk, it took about, you know, two to three months. Um, well, writing down Lambda.js took a weekend. Getting this composition to have the same behavior as all these implementations took about two to three months. So this is why it's a bad idea to write down DSugar, because then you're forced to like actually spend three months rather than a weekend. Um, now, I want to point out that there's a particular structure we're using here, right? We have this DSugar function, and we have this Lambda.js. And Lambda.js, now the question is, which is the semantics? In fact, my student Arjun and I have argued back and forth quite a bit about what we should call the semantics. Is it Lambda.js or is it DSugar and Lambda.js? And it's actually a question worth asking because it's not entirely clear to me. Um, but Lambda.js in some sense is the really interesting thing here, right? It's, it's this curated object. It's our attempt at providing an essence of the language. You might come up with a different essence that fits on a page or two. But it is an attempt at providing this carefully curated understanding of the language. It provides insight into JavaScript. We make decisions in there about what to put in there, what not to put in there, to try to offer some insights so somebody coming to this language could either read Crockford's book and say, oh, it's basically Scheme, or they could read this and say, oh, I see. For example, when I try to mutate a field that isn't there, it gets added to the object. That's something that Lambda.js represents directly. There are other things it chooses not to represent directly. This is really important. It's a great target for proofs. We did this because we wanted to be able to build tools and prove them sound. You can't prove soundness over things that have hundreds of cases. Maybe you can if you had a lot of tool support, but then there's still a human labor question involved. We wanted something small enough that we could even do proofs by hand and still claim to have done proofs over the whole language. And that was the goal of shrinking the language, shrinking the core language to be that small. One of the things we observed, and this is just a, this is just a human observation, there's no mathematical law that underlies this, is that initially, you know, it took a while to get this composition to work out. But after about a week or so, Lambda.js pretty much stopped changing. It very rarely changed. Every time we got new tests and we found tests that didn't work, most of the work went into DSugar. Now that may be because we understood JavaScript well enough that we were able to write a pretty good initial candidate. But it does say that if you have a pretty good core calculus, you can put most of the effort into fixing the DSugaring and Lambda.js stays stable. When the language makes small changes, Lambda.js tends to stay the same, desugaring is what changes. So this gives us a stable target for tools and for proofs. And finally, I feel like this is the essence of science, right? It's our goal. I mean, you know, you heard Tony's talk, right? Tony, uh, Tony took a small amount of stuff and made a lot out of it. I'm taking a huge amount of stuff and not doing very much. But, I mean, I'm, that's because I've been given a huge amount of stuff to start with. But I still feel like, you know, Tony's talk represented the essence of what we're trying to do as scholars here is trying to distill things down to their essence, have a small number of interchangeable parts that we can put together. If we understand their meanings, we can then understand the meaning of bigger things. So when people write down semantics, you know, we've heard several talks over the past two days about semantics, and of course, the whole point of the PlanCom project is to have these little bits we can put together. But we've also heard about these fairly maximal semantics, right? 1,200 line specifications and so on. I don't think of that as much of a specification because I don't quite know how to work with that. Having things distilled down to me is the essence of what we're really trying to do. So we put this out about uh, four years ago. We've had lots of users for the system. Several people have tried to do various <laughs> things with it. Um, I guess after yesterday's talk, I should add like a little uh, disclaimer at the bottom there. Um, but, but are you going to talk about the, um, the other direction from Lambda.js JavaScript? 
Oh, that's a very interesting question. I'm actually going to talk about it at the end. I'll have a slide about that at the very end, right? Okay, good. Um, ha, huh, good. That was almost like a sponsored ad. I'm sorry? You can get rid of that. Oh, oh, okay, okay. No, this is almost like a sponsored uh, ad placement there. Very nice. Okay, but now, so that's enough about JavaScript. I don't really want to talk about JavaScript the rest of today. Let's pull back a little bit. What we're trying to do here is to use tests as specifications. Okay? Now, you know, we were told earlier that we should think of denotational semantics and testing as being closely aligned. Well, denotational semantics is a specification. Testing is essentially a really, really poor man's denotational semantics. Right? That's what it is. So, yes, we know all the problems with testing. The moment you say testing, everyone can trot out the Dijkstra quote, right? What's the Dijkstra quote? Testing reveals the something or other. Yeah, you can go. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Testing reveals the something or the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Demonstrates the presence of bugs but can't prove their absence. Yes, we know all that. So, I prefer to think of it this way. Tests are, they're very incomplete, of course. They're only a finite approximation of this big denotation. But they are formal objects. And they're very lightweight. They're easy to write down. They're easy for all sorts of people, even people who don't understand algebra, to write down. In contrast, implementations have this problem that they over-specify the behavior. There may be all sorts of consequences of an implementation that may or may not have been intended. The tests, hopefully, are a specification of what somebody actually intended. Um, the great thing about tests is they tend to keep up with the evolution of systems. And finally, yesterday, somebody, one of the people, one of the speakers spoke, and somebody asked a question about how do you work with the standards bodies? Testing is a great way to work with standards bodies. We've actually had some experience with this. Uh, people asked us why we're not pushing for Lambda.js to be in the ECMAScript specification of JavaScript. And my response is always, it's pointless. The people who write that spec and the people who read that spec couldn't care less. They don't know what an evaluation context is. They wouldn't know if, it, if, it, if their lives depended on it. But they understand tests, and the committee now publishes test suites as their way of presenting what you know another definition of the language other than the 250-page document. We work with these test suites. In fact, for a while, you know, kind of like the story we heard yesterday, right? We were tracking the test suite so carefully, we were doing better than Firefox was on getting on conformance with the test suite, right? I mean, these things happen. Real systems behave in funny ways. But the point is, this is a great way to interface with a standards body. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to be talking about using testing for various purposes. And keep in mind that this is a under used resource that we have in programming language semantics. So now let me pull back even further. So I've talked about JavaScript, talked a little bit about our perspective on semantics. Now I want to pull back. Anyone recognize this photograph, this picture? It's full of typos and stuff. It's great. So obviously you know because I said it's full of typos. It's from Wikipedia. This is Wikipedia's web. This is the picture on Wikipedia's page on programming language paradigms. Right? This, this is an idea that we have been un, unable to kill yet. Maybe someday we will succeed at killing this idea of paradigms. But here you go. Apparently, there's about that many of them. Right? And it's, it's all taxonomized, so it must be correct. right? Um, well, languages don't fit in these slots. right? The problem is you, you look at papers on JavaScript and say, well, JavaScript is an object-oriented language, or whatever the heck that means. JavaScript's a functional language, whatever the heck that means. I prefer to think of it as, you know, there's this wonderful story about the first time one of these things was shipped back from Australia to England. <laughs> you know what happened? They shipped this back, right? The, the, so they, these guys go out to Australia. They find this object. They say, wow, what on earth is this? They send it back to England. The Royal Society gets it and proceeds to rip it apart <laughs> because they were looking for the stitches. They were so convinced it was a hoax <laughs> They said there is no earthly way that bill is fitted onto that body. So they went looking for the stitches to see where the bill had been stitched on. At the end of it, they didn't find any and wrote a note back saying, oh, could we have another one? Now we want to study this thing. Right? So there's your paradigms for you, right? This is what programming languages look like today. In fact, this is a great description of JavaScript, right? It's got like a nose of self and the body of scheme and like the web footing of like who knows what. Um, and these are the objects we we kind of have not much of a choice but to study because they're using, you know, our underlying infrastructure depends on them. So I come to think of semantics less as a strictly mathematical discipline. It is still a mathematical discipline.
but I've come to think of semantics as closer to natural science. These languages we're working with, these systems we're working with, they are effectively found objects in nature. That is the right way to think about them. There are these objects that are lying out there, we pick them up, all we can kind of do is sort of poke and probe at them, make inspections, try to derive some understanding of their behavior from it. And I, I mean, some of you look a little uncomfortable, that's good, okay? So I've given us something to talk about over drinks. But the other reason to take this perspective is, you know, for people, the other, when you have these talks on JavaScript, there's always people saying, but what about the spec? What about that 250 page document? It's really important, right? I mean, it's crucial that your semantics be able to map line to line and you can point out where each line came from. Well, here's the reality. It depends on your task. If your task is to prove security theorems, attackers don't attack the specification. They attack implementations, they attack the reality of these systems, they don't attack the specs, right? And that's why I think I'm pushing for this natural science perspective. We've gone too far in one direction, we need to find a way to balance these two, even though my ultimate goal is the same as that of many of you, which is to have these concise formal descriptions, mathematical descriptions, with which we can prove real theorems. Okay, so that's the setup, that's the background. Now I wanna talk about moving forward. To do that, um, let me first uh, talk a little bit about the effort needed to come up with one of these semantics. So yesterday, uh, we had this wonderful talk by Grigore. Oh, by the way, you know, the, the, this is this, all this JavaScript stuff. Urbana needs to like be paying us checks for this at some point, right? It's your graduates to so do this kind of thing. So efforts for, let's talk about the effort it takes, right? Here are three lines, of, three things that Grigore mentioned. He said one to 1.5 years per language, you know, hundreds, thousands of rules sometimes, and you also point out the configuration changes a lot, right? So this is a continuous effort. Once you dedicate yourself doing one of these semantics, you're constantly stuck doing them. Um, these are Gregory's numbers. Uh, mine are comparable. So for Cisco IOS, it took about a year with two people involved. Uh, but as a lot of that was the parsing. Um, we don't know much about parsing. Maybe some of you could have done a lot better. Um, ECMAScript 3, which was the first JavaScript thing we did, the Lambda.js part, took about three months of two people. Um, Knowing everything we did to get to ECMAScript 5 took five months, including a graduate course. And then to do the DOM events took another graduate course and it took about seven months times four people, okay? And then we got to Python. <laughs> so the way we did Python was actually a little interesting. So here's, here's the, here's the uh, cover of the paper. And you <coughs> notice I've listed a bunch of locations rather than affiliations. That's because what I did was in the fall, I taught my programming languages course online. We then recruited the top students from the online course and put them for the remaining, so the final project was to do a very baby tested Python. And then we spent the entire spring semester scaling up for the baby Python to most of the full language. And basically it's pure coincidence that three of the people, you know, we had six survivors basically, because my PhD student is the number one, first author. So we had six survivors in this effort three of whom happened to be undergraduates at Brown and three of them happened to be like distributed around the world. Um, Jun Song is actually coming to Brown as a master's student. Um, Anand is a professional programmer in India and Alejandro is a, is a triathlete who used to be a software developer and is now essentially retired, okay? So essentially we crowdsourced the problem of trying to do the Python semantics. So I can't even begin to count how much effort went into this, okay? Question? Yes. Versus five and all that. Do you have any uh, thought about the implementation language? So your first version of Lambda Days was in Haskell and Dr. and the second version is different. And right. Uh, well, so we typically <coughs> produce two models for each. We produce a runtime system, well, an a running implementation, but we also do a Redex model. So for each of these, as a Redex model, we've had some cock models in the middle as well. Um, I don't think Haskell versus Racket versus OCaml has made any difference at all. Um, it's helped a little bit, like, you know, Haskell parsing combinator seemed really useful. Then we found OCaml was maybe a less painful language to deal with for other reasons. I don't think it, I wish it could, I, I'd love to be able to stand here and say, oh, Racket was awesome or something else was awesome. They, no, not really. Yeah. And this is with some very qualified programmers too. Yeah. Okay, so that's like four languages and we've already taught it up like, I don't know, several person years of effort and, you know, how many languages do we need to do? Well. There's a lot of languages out there. There's a lot of popular languages out there, right? And there's a lot of languages in which there are millions of lines of code that we need to worry about. 
And you go to you know, Wikipedia, here's a list of new languages that are implemented on top of the JVM, and I don't think that even fits on the page. Right? And if you go to something like uh, you know, Stack Overflow, you get questions like this. Right? This is a popular question on Stack Overflow. Now the answers are terrifying. The answers are terrifying. The answers are always, oh, go read the Dragon Book. It has the most awesome parsing chapter or something. It's always about parsing. Always about damn parsing. Never about semantics. Every one of these threads, always about parsing. Okay? But never mind that. And, you know, no ASF, SDF, unfortunately. But, you know, that you should go on Stack Overflow and start answering these questions. So the point is, you know, we should be happy about this at some level, right? Everybody wants to build languages. It's now a democratic activity, right? Everybody wants to build their own programming language. And unfortunately, we can't predict which of these is going to be the next PHP and is going to be around for the next 20 years haunting us. So, um, you know, this is, this is a problem if you care about being able to build semantics for real world systems. And it's worse than this because it's not just about languages because it's also about the environments and the APIs, like I talked about the DOM. The DOM isn't a language, it's just a big library that represents the behavior of the JavaScript, of the browser that's associated with JavaScript or whatever else you're programming in. Um, I talked about access control languages. Again, these aren't you know, full-blown programming languages, these are all the things on the side, but if you can't reason about their behavior, in some cases, they get called out to, like access control languages get called out to by the program. In some other cases, it's even worse. If you think about the JavaScript on a web page, it just sits there doing nothing. It's inert. It does nothing. Its only behavior is defined by the events that come into it because of user actions, which are defined by the DOM. And there's a pretty complicated, it's actually the DOM is really the right way to think about it, in my opinion, is it's a control operator. Because you click on something and events, there's sort of a bubble, there's a capture phase followed by an action phase followed by a bubble phase, and at every point you can sort of jump out of it, et cetera. It's, it's a pretty fascinating thing to study in a sort of morbid way, of course. Um, so without this, we can't even reason about the behavior of these systems. Now, it would be nice if we lived in a world where people started from simple, good algebraic principles, um, and maybe we can push them in that direction, but this is the ugly world we live in. So for the last part of this talk, um, I, I, want, I made up some slides specifically for Andrew because poor Andrew has heard me speak a few too many times and keeps hearing the same darn things over and over again. So I, try, I made up some new slides specifically. These are for you, Andrew. Okay? So clearly we have this problem, right? We somehow have to get the next 700 semantics. So we've started to make some very modest efforts in this direction. Um, this is the picture I showed you, right? This is my way of thinking about semantics. I've got some P language over there got programs in that language, I want to construct a lambda p. Now, as I said, I want to think of this lambda language as a human designed artifact. It's the way we try to provide insight. It's the way we try to communicate our understanding, our knowledge of the language, okay? But there's this thing in the middle, as I said, that, that thing takes a weekend and this thing takes three months. So, stands to reason, this is the stuff we should try to automate if we can, okay? So here's what I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume I have a parser for P. I, I know nothing about parsing, literally. In fact, in graduate school, the qualifying exam, there was a question on parsing. There always is, and I left it blank because I was like, you know, what are they going to do, fail me? So, you know, somebody else can deal with parsing. There are plenty of people in this room who are geniuses on parsing. And, but if nothing else, there's an implementation of P. Otherwise, we wouldn't be worried about it. And if there's an implementation, it's got a parser. Let's just rip out its parser, okay? So there's always a way of getting a parser for P. Um, Almost, almost, yes, I know, I know, I know. I hear the laughs in the audience, yes, good. Okay, so there's, let's say we have a parser. Let's say that somebody is gonna write down a candidate lambda p because that's really where I want our attention as semanticists to be focused, right? Whether it's, you know, an operational semantics, whether you're gonna take, you know, fun comps and put them together, however you do it, I want us to focus on producing a lambda p. And if we have a lambda p, let's assume we have an evaluator for it. So if it's an operational model, it's especially easy. You can write an interpreter for it or something like that. Okay, now, here's our problem. We have P programs, and we need to obtain the corresponding lambda P program, right? That's what dsugar does. It translates this tree into that tree. Yes, all clear? That's, that's our story here. Well, let's learn this, right? Let's learn this using machine translation. 
Um, and just to be clear, when I say machine translation, I mean basically the same technology that's under, underneath, say, Google Translate. Is there a Bing Translate? Am I saying something politically incorrect? There may be, okay, Bing Translate, okay? So let's use the technology that sits <laughs> under human language translation techniques, okay? That's what I'm proposing. Now, there is a big difference, which is the following. So I, I, I know nothing about machine translation. Everything I know I've learned in the past few months, which is very little, so those of you who know much more than me, Jump in, correct me, please. Um, but uh, the basically, the key, one of the key techniques is tree alignment. Basically, I've got a tree over here, I've got a tree over here, and I need to align the pieces of the tree. Okay? And we need to infer, we need to induct an alignment for this tree. The way it works in natural languages is you have lots of input sentences. That's kind of how you learn a model of the input language. Well, that's okay. We, that's no problem for us, right? We can have lots of P programs, otherwise we wouldn't be caring about this problem. You also have lots of lambda, you also need lots of lambda p programs, which is also easy. We can just go and generate lambda p programs. But the tricky thing is, they also want these things to be aligned, right? They want to start with lots of examples of input output pairs from which they are going to infer this, okay? Um, and the magic number I've heard from talking to two different experts, I've talked to Kevin Knight, I've talked to Eugene Charniak, the magic number I've heard is they'd like at least a million, you know, if you can give us 10 million, that'd be great. Well, we're not gonna get even a million, right? I mean, we, I'm not gonna sit there and write a million different inputs. Um, so this is basically a non-starter. Well, except it's not a non-starter because we have something they don't have, okay? You see what we have that they don't have? You see it? We yeah. Structure in, in the, we have nested structure, so if we have nested structure, that's true. Though, I mean, they do have parse tree. They, they infer a parse tree, right? They learn a language model from which they pretend they have a parse tree. So they don't that's. They do much in the way of subsentential. Sub um, that's right. That's right. Yes. Oh, test cases. Very good. Very good. But they want a million. I mean, I have only so many grad students. If I went back and started writing a million test cases, they'd be a little annoyed. They might move to Pisa instead, and that would be unfortunate for me. You may write a test case generator from... I don't know the ground... Uh, well, that's a tricky... That's where, where we're trying to go. Yes, other hands up. I saw another hand up. Yes. Yeah. Well, you can tell exactly when a translation is correct. Ah, right there. Ground truth. They don't have ground truth. If they propose an English, you know, if they say, I need an English to French translator, they go and steal a million sentences off of, like, you know, the government of Quebec website, right? I mean, they actually literally do, um, but they don't steal them. I mean, they borrow them, I guess. They copy them. Um, but uh, the problem is they don't, but given the millionth and first sentence, they have no idea whether they got it right. Now, of course, you know, if you're thinking in a sort of hip modern way, you'd say, oh, you put it on Mechanical Turk, and they do. Like Chris Calston Birch does this. He takes these generated sentences, puts them on Mechanical Turk as a training mechanism to see whether these sentences are any good. Um, yes, it kind of works. Um, but we can do much better. We have ground truth, okay? And ground truth is kind of useful to have. So here basically is the learning algorithm here. We're going to hypothesize a lambda p, right? We'll put, a, put our brains to it and say, we've really understood, I don't know, Ruby or whatever. Let's write down a lambda p, okay? We're going to write several examples, not a million, but maybe, you know, a hundred examples of E programs and corresponding lambda E pro, la, P programs and lambda P programs, right? So I'm going to write down Ruby programs. I'm going to write down lambda Ruby programs, right? And that's something I could potentially even crowdsource, right? If I could get, you know, if I could put out Lambda Ruby in a way that people on Mechanical Turk can understand, then maybe I can get it. We haven't done that yet. It's worth trying, okay? And then we learned this transducer, okay? There's some technical details. Basically, it's Gibbs sampling because it's a multivariate space. And uh, basically, the random variables are how, how likely is it that this particular transformation rule applies, okay? Now, we have a proposed desugaring function. That's what we get out of this tree transducer learning process. We now take a new candidate, we generate a new input program, and we run it through. If the thing matches, hey, great, our hypothesis is validated. This is in fact a good tree trans, this is in fact a good desugaring function. We go off and try another one, okay? If it fails, well, now we have a problem. Basically, we have to adjust the input. And there's two ways to adjust the input. One possibility is we write, we, we, you give me this candidate, you say, here's a program, the learned desugar produced the wrong output. 
Well, you could just take that and you know, give that to the expert. The expert will say, oh, for that program, here is the correct lambda p equivalent. Okay? Here's the new ground truth. We'll add that to the set of tests and rerun the process. Sometimes you will discover, presumably, that your lambda p was not the best hypothesis. You might want to actually correct your lambda p and improve it a little <coughs> bit, add maybe a new feature. You might say, oh, I never really thought about multiple inheritance. Maybe I should change my semantics to include multiple inheritance, and now I have to add some more examples that help it learn about multiple inheritance. And basically, you iterate this process. Okay? So this is, the, this is our, our hope that this kind of thing would work. Um, as I told Andrew over lunch, unfortunately, we've had a little bit of success, which is terrible because now we're going to waste three years finding out it doesn't actually work. Um, but here's what we've done. We've got this as our input language so far. Um, it's a very simple language, right? It's got primitives. It's got in between. You know, between is basically is this value between these two values, OK? Um, conditionals, numbers, strings, and constants. And there's our target language, OK? So in particular, it has particular kinds of primitives. This one has like lists of primitives, and that has just one and two early primitives. It has that little let feature, has variables, and has holes for representing the, the rewrite, right? This is where the sub-pieces go. And we've actually successfully learned a desugaring function for this pair of languages. Uh, to give you an example, um, the rule that it is most likely to use for a between looks like this. It says, let x1 be basically the first sub-expression. Let x2 be the second sub-expression. Let x3 be the second, third sub-expression. And then check that x1 is less than x2 and x2 is less than x3. And this was actually learned on five examples. So, so <laughs> as I said, <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's about to get bad. We're starting to look into variables and so on. Uh, but this is, this is what we have so far. Questions? <laughs> I have friends in the machine learning yes. world, and uh, mostly for learning grammars, not this yeah. stuff. But how do you make sure that what you get is, in some sense, small? So are you providing input examples and output examples? Because you know there are going to be many desugarings which look insane to a human, but which are semantically equivalent. That's absolutely. How do you, how do you handle this? It's the it's the it's the thing that goes wrong. It seems to me. Uh, this is absolutely right. It depends on what your purpose is of obtaining a desugaring in the first place. Right? Um, one of the things, um, so this is not something I, I plan to discuss, but um, I think it's worth talking about. I, I, I mentioned this in one of my later slides. I don't think as a research community we have paid enough attention to, uh, we as the sort of the PL semantics community, right, have paid enough attention to this kind of desugaring process. Uh, one of the things we've learned, in fact, from talking to MSR Redmond people who've looked at Lambda, Lambda JS quite carefully and have thought about using it for various purposes, is we, we spend a lot of attention on the source language, and really we need a whole bunch of program transformations, equivalences, reductions, and so on, on the target language as well. For example, Lambda JS, as uh, Sukyung pointed out, it's got some issues when you try to use it. One of the things it does is you take a program this big and whew, you get a program this big, and that's with the human carefully handwritten desugaring. But um, Matt Mike pointed out, so he was trying to use Lambda.js, and he realized that a whole bunch of this code could just be constant folded. Because it's just, you know, it's the typical recursive descent process of, gen you know, as you know how code generators work. And if you constant fold it, you get much more sensible programs. And so he actually has a constant folder. And uh, there's, you can do, if you do sort of a combination of value propagation and constant folding, you get much smaller programs. Okay? So I believe there's a fertile ground to do a whole bunch of cleanups and optimizations. Now, and so there's two different strategies. One is maybe you can try to make the desugaring function you learn be more sane. The other possibility is you just define these equivalences on the produced terms. Because if all you're trying to do is to obtain a term, maybe the one you obtain is fine. If what you're trying to do is to produce a term that a human being can read, you go crank away at it for several minutes and then say, here's this much smaller term, and that's the one you want to look at. Okay? So to be completely honest with you, this is a problem we already have. We have some ideas about how to go about solving it. And the act of learning a desugaring will almost certainly make it worse. Okay? Full disclosure, it's, it's, it's research. Okay? But, but you're absolutely right. It's a totally valid, valid point. Yes? You have a general assumption that desugar is compositionally defined. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's compositionality, there's state, there's a bunch of different things. We've got some thoughts about what to do about non-compositional <laughs> cases, but honestly, I think 
those are cases where one of two things should happen. Either the person, the author, should just write down the non-compositional -composi desugaring rule, you know, if there's like a lambda lifting or something involved, or in, again, in our experience with, uh, with these multiple languages, sometimes those non-compositional things are kind of important language features and then perhaps should really be in the target language. I know this sounds a bit like a cop-out, right? I'm saying my technique can't handle it, so we'll put it in the core, but I think there is a case to be made that in many of these cases, they really should end up in the core language because they somehow represent, they embody some, some important thing about this language that's <coughs> important for people to understand, okay? So again, another non-answer to a good question. Yes? So how would you be frustrated by having this learning process? Like, you know, oh, this part should be in the target language. When are you going to decide or determine that? Ah, so, so I'm very particular <laughs> about the fact that we are not going to derive lambda L for you, right? You have to write down a lambda L and you have to write down an evaluator for lambda L. It's not for us. I mean, I, here's the thing. Learning a semantics is, on the one hand, well, on the one hand, it's kind of trivial, right? Because for every language you give me, I'll give you the semantics that says, here's a Turing machine. End of problem, right? It's constant function. It produces semantics in constant time. That's not very useful, right? On the other hand, if I leave the problem unconstrained and somehow want a good semantics, that's too unconstrained and there's no way to solve that. So instead, I prefer to think of it as a fitting problem where somebody has put some intelligent design to writing down the lambda language, and then the problem is to fit the lambda language against the source. Otherwise, you get too unconstrained a problem. Thinking of it this way seems to be a place where it's constrained enough we might be able to do something and we can reuse all this wonderful machine learning technology that's been applied to natural language. As I said, it's not the same problem, but we might be able to reuse some of it. Right. Yes? Just a quick comment, I mean, your, your T there looks like a particular selection of fun comps, so never mind. Ah, very good, <laughs> excellent. Yes, so uh, yes, we are learning fun comps, there you go. I've justified my trip now, there you go. Um, Okay, uh, other comments. So um, one other thing I wanted to say, uh, Sukyung asked a question about uh, what do you do when you want to go back in the other direction, right? There's this debugability problem. Um, it's actually much worse than that, as you know, everyone who does model-driven stuff knows. You start off with some lang program in L, you desugar it, and you have this lambda L program, um, and then you start running it, and you run it, and it's off running in lambda L land, and somehow you have to get this back into an L program. And not even every step makes sense to show as an L program, right? You might have an argument, you might say that if a term consists entirely or significantly of terms introduced by the desugaring process, you don't want to see that term because it wouldn't make any sense to the source programmer. There isn't even a way of converting it back, so you only want to convert back some of the terms, those that can actually be meaningfully reinterpreted in the source language. And if you can do that, then you can essentially imagine that you're running your program in L, even though actually it's running in lambda L, right? So we have a first result in this direction. We now have for certain uh, reasonably powerful macros and rewriting systems, so at least powerful enough to sort of capture, you know, uh, syntax rules and scheme, for example, if that means anything to you. We can now reverse this process so we can give you this effective reduction re re semantics that's entirely in L, and so you can ignore what's happening in lambda L. And we have some good properties about the kinds of terms you see. Essentially, you will not see ter things that were introduced by the desugaring process, so it will appear to you that you are working entirely in the source language, okay? So that's the first result we have in this direction. We're right now working to extend this to cover the kinds of desugarings we do in JavaScript and Python. Um, there's a new language I'm going to mention, and that's the one we're currently building this out for. Okay. So um, since I knew I was going to be between you and drinks and didn't want to take uh, too long, let me summarize what I've tried to say today. Um, First is, I think we, you know, it's wonderful to hear that lots of people are trying to do these kinds of tested semantics now, but I think we have to keep in mind that the purpose of a semantics is not simply to be another implementation, we have enough of those, but rather to try to provide some kind of insight into the language, and trying to strike that balance is tricky, but I think we have to, we have to commit ourselves to trying to strike it. Um, second, I've tried to argue that this decomposition into desugaring and core, it's not a new idea at all. Everyone in the PL community has known this for decades. But it does offer us, it seems to have some nice affordances for various kinds of activities. Maybe for the learning process, maybe for the debugging process and so on. So it's worth investigating more. 
related to that, as I said, desugaring itself needs to be taken more seriously. For example, the theorems that govern this uh, thing I showed on the previous slide are statements about the structure of the desugarings you write, right? Essentially, certain kinds of desugarings are easy to reverse, certain are harder. It's not quite as simple as compositionality. It also has to do with like rule ordering and unification and so on. There's some, there's some interesting technical work there. And finally, tests are underutilized. We don't use tests nearly enough. There's a lot of richness there. It's a great way of communicating with developers, with standards communities, and so on. And as a community, we should try to use them more. Um, for me personally, looking ahead, as I said, we want to try to scale this desugaring process. Who knows? Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Um, I want to think about improving the theory and tools for desugaring along the lines that I've already outlined in this talk. And finally, I'm sick and tired of scripting languages. They suck, they're horrible, and I know everything now there is to know about how much they suck. So <laughs> what we've been trying to do is to build uh, better languages. Um, we've been working on this language for some, two years now that we're going to put out this summer, and it's called uh, Pirate. Um, tries to take what we think are really important elements of scripting. Um, it has this amazing idea. Static scope actually works right, right? It's just <laughs> stunning, okay? Which means you can build an IDE for it. Uh, one of the things we discovered in doing this Python work that I mentioned uh, earlier this afternoon was, um, you know, we have, we have an eight-line Python program. No tricks, no eval, nothing, okay? Absolutely no tricks, no horribleness, right? Just a simple eight-line pro Python program went to three different Python IDEs and did the variable renaming operation that they had. Yes, you got it, right? All three got it wrong, and all three got it wrong in different ways. Because nobody understands scope in scripting land. It's just unbelievable how bad the scope story is. So our greatest contribution may turn out to be that we actually got static scoping right, but we're trying to do other things as well. Uh, we're trying to design the language so that it is typable. We're taking everything we know about type systems from you know, having studied ML and Haskell and so forth and trying to make sure from the outset the design of the language does not inhibit types, that the design of the language encourages types, the design of the language encourages IDEs and static reasoning and so on, while still trying to preserve what we think are the interesting elements of scripting languages, the sort of objects as this object dictionary thing. Short version is objects and dictionaries are treated as an equivalence. I think that's a mistake. I think the interesting thing is that objects can be regarded as dictionaries, but going from dictionaries to objects needs a little bit of work. If we make developers do a little bit of work to go in the opposite direction, all of a sudden we get flexibility without getting sort of freeformness. And that's the, that's the game we're trying to study right now. Um, well, I'm teaching, I'm going to be teaching this in my courses in the fall, and we're building an online learning environment for it. So it'll be out in the fall, and if you're interested, you can take a look when it comes out. Um, that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to take more questions. I've left a lot of time for questions. Hopefully, I've said something provocative. But I also wanted to leave you with one last slide. Um, this is something I found on the web. I was actually reading some uh, literature on climate <coughs> science, and eventually got a pointer to this. Um, and I guess it's kind of especially appropriate. Right? We're, all, we're not quite in East Anglia, but we're in Anglia, right? <laughs> We're in East Anglia, okay, good, then especially appropriate. But um, this, is, this is Emmanuel Derman, anyone recognize the name? Emmanuel Derman is one of the world's top quants. He's one of these like, you know, uh, French ENS graduates, whatever, ended up, of course, like all these people, you know, with theoretical physicist means, of course, he ends up on Wall Street because that's what, you know, that's what theoretical physicists do. And he's one of the world's top quants, but after 2008, he wrote this, uh, he and Paul Wilmot wrote this thing that they call the not, the Modeler's Hippocratic Oath. And I will give you time to read it for yourself <laughs> while I'm also happy to take questions. Good, there you go.